Thank you, Nadia. Uh, good evening, students and faculty and visitors. My name is Patrick Montaigne. I'm a senior film and video student at the Maryland Institute College of Art. And for this evening, I have the priv privilege of introducing to you all our guest speaker. He has gone by many names over the years. Hank Hardy Unra, Andreas Bickelbauer, Granwith Hulitberry, Kenneth Ern Spratt, Jude Finisterra, S.K. Wolf, Hensley Cocker, Renee Oswin, Hingo Simbra, Benedict Waterman, the grandson of the Ayatollah Khomeini, but many know him best as Andy Bickelbaum, a professional artist and activist who, for more than two decades, has utilized culture jamming techniques and performances in order to interrupt mainstream cultural institutions to promote progressive change. In 1996, Andy drew some attention when he was fired for adding code into the game Simcopter, which caused men in swimming trunks to spawn and kiss each other, which was a response to the overtly heterosexual atmosphere of the game. This prank was the first to be officially sponsored by R.T. Marx, an anti-consumerist activist collective founded by Andy. Later on in the 90s, Andy and Mike Bonanno formed the Yes Men, and since have taken on the likes of Dow Chemicals, ExxonMobil, Shell Oil, and the U.S the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and many more. With the help of fellow activists and artists, the Yes Men disguise themselves as public relations spokesmen for major corporations in order to bring awareness to corruption, inhumane actions, and environmental issues. Andy has taught at the Parsons School of Design and in NYU, has released two books with, of short stories. As a part of the Yes Men, he has released three films and has been a recipient of multiple awards, including a DOCU win and a Panorama Audience Award for their films, the, for their film, The Yes Men Fix the World. Currently, the Yes Men are hard at work on their secret fourth film that is planned to be finished in 2021. Last semester, during a short meeting, Nadia asked the senior film and video majors to think about visiting artists that they would like to see speak at MICA. I had recently watched a few uh, Yes Men films and thought their risky activism was engaging, but also handled but also handled in a thoughtful way compared to other mischievous documentary works I had seen before. I knew I wanted to get the Yes Men out here. I found their agent, and with the help of Nadia and Micah, the rest was history. To conclude with my introduction, I think the amount of experience Andy has had throughout his career as an activist filmmaker and the knowledge he's gained from trial and error is relevant to new filmmakers and artists. So without further ado, I give you Andy Bickelbaum. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, maybe I'll do this. Thanks so much for that beautiful introduction. And thanks to both of you for bringing me, um, Nadia and Patrick. It's really lovely to be here for apparently the second time. <laughs> but the first time was a long time ago. Um, and I haven't given a lot of talks in the last year or two. Um, so I'm going to kind of switch it up. I was looking at the usual way I did it. And um, instead of just going through uh, the story, because a, a lot of people here have seen recently the uh, Yes Men and the Yes Men are revolting, or one or the other, right? So I'm just going to, I'm going to focus on the second movie, The Yes Men Fix the World. And I'm going to start by showing the trailer uh, to our current movie, the one that we're working on now which is not a public trailer. It's really for pitching to funding organizations, and that's the way we've used it. Um, but we really worked the introduction to who the Yes Men are. So instead of trying to repeat that, I'm just going to play it. And it also tells you about our new movie a little bit. And again, it's not super public, but I think it's acceptable. Oh, it's invisible, too. Um, let me see. I go to... I'm afraid so. Um. <laughs> All right. Hey, we're Andy and Mike, the Yes Men. We've been political activists for the last 20 years. Mostly, we've used pranks and hoaxes to reveal what's going wrong in the world. So what should our next project be? Build that wall. Build that wall! Build that wall! I think Build someone needs wall. us. Build that wall! Build that wall! Build that wall! Build that wall! Maybe we should take these things off for this because it's more official and I'll 
take off my Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a good point. <clears throat> we can help Trump build the greatest wall ever and show the world how absurd this all is. We should look at all the best walls in the world. The king's motive to build the wall was to demonstrate his power as a monarch. We want to build a wall? Do you have samples? Do you have uh, sugar? Oh wow, this one's really sharp. You want to have the dramatic shot? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. When you have like your, your body in it, mm -hmm. you, you will stop moving because you just gonna whip your, your skin. That's wonderful. Wait a second. This isn't wonderful. And we're not revealing anything because no one's hiding anything anymore. How can we hoax this? Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> Also, I just don't feel like laughing anymore. Me neither. We should find out in each place why people want to walk. Okay. That's her trailer. <laughs> you don't have to applaud. It's, it's very in progress. Um, and I cut off the last part because I don't do it quite agree with it. Um, yeah, so I think I'll just find the cursor. Oh. I'll just start telling the story of the Yes Men and who we are. Um, this is what we did for a while, but this isn't our first movie. Um, I wanted to skip over all this. It's very funny, but oop. Um, okay, so this is um, th two uh, two of our movies. Uh, actually, it's the first movie. It's the five pranks in the first movie, and that's the way I get into talking about the second movie, um, in which uh, basically we're activists, and we got started by uh, putting up a fake website for the World Trade Organization. Uh, during the 1999 protests against the World Trade Organization. And uh, because the WTO reacted to our fake website that looked just like the real WTO website but had nothing but satirical content on it, um, we ended up going to a conference um, as the WTO. The WTO reacted to the website, attacked us, and that got a lot of press, and that got the, the, um, the website into search engines. And then more and more, when people would search on World Trade Organization, they would stumble on our website. And eventually, we uh, received an email from a conference in Austria inviting us to a conference, and we went. Um, and that's how we got our start as the Yes Men. It's a long story. Um, but we kept basically doing that, just putting up fake websites. Um, in 2001, uh, a friend of ours at Greenpeace suggested that we try doing this against Dow Chemical Corporation to highlight a really important um, issue. Um, Dow had purchased, and it was much more kind of on the ground, uh, kind of real and concrete than the stuff that we were uh, doing with the, the fake. Does everybody know what the World Trade Organization is, by the way? It's okay if you don't. Anybody not? Um, okay, it, it was the body that uh, kind of made trade rules um, that countries had to obey. Um, and companies, it basically privileged companies over national sovereignty. That's the long and the short of it. Um, and that's what's meant by the anti-globalization movement from uh, you know, the 90s, it was basically a movement to, uh, that basically said democracy is more important than corporate uh, rights to make money. Um, 
So that sort of system, which privileged the large corporation's ability to do business regardless of what people might want, uh, was really best exemplified in um, the problems with it were best exemplified by um, this situation that, that sprang up for us in our consciousness in 2001. Um, the world's worst industrial disaster was caused in, uh, by a company called Union Carbide in 1984. Has anybody heard of that? Okay, a couple of people. Um, it was the Bhopal disaster, and you'll find out a little more about it soon, so I won't tell you too much, but it was caused by this company, Union Carbide, which um, had a plant, a chemical plant in India that it failed to maintain because it was in India, and they don't have a lot of lawyers there. Um, and it was the same plant as the one that they had in uh, several copies of in the US that never had anything wrong with them. This one was substandard, poorly maintained, and it burst a pipe and sprayed toxic gas into the atmosphere and killed 2,000 people in one night and another uh, 18,000 or so over the uh, subsequent years. And they never um, really compensated the survivors more than $500 a piece. Um, and they eventually went bankrupt, but they were purchased by a much larger company called Dow Chemical in 2001. And that company could have actually afforded to do something about it at that point. It was far from bankrupt. Um, one of the largest chemical companies in the world, an American company located in Michigan, um, and we were approached by Greenpeace to try to draw attention to the fact that this company had purchased Union Carbide and was now responsible for this disaster and for not compensating or compensating the, the survivors, cleaning up the site, which activists were demanding, um, survivors were demanding, and so on. Um, so, long story short, we were approached by our friend at Greenpeace, he suggested we do something like we had done with the World Trade Organization, set up a fake website, we did. Um, I set up a, a fake site at dow-chemical.com, I think it was, that looked just like the real Dow site, um, but had a lot of critical information on it and critical um, content. And one fine, and, and you know, we publicized this fake website, we, sent out a fake press release announcing that Dow would never compensate the survivors of Bhopal because they would never um, be able to afford lawyers, which was kind of true. And it got a little attention because this was 2001 when people didn't do this very much. So a little, you know, fake, a little prank like this could actually get attention like a New York Times article, which it did. And that caused, similarly to the uh, fake WTO sites, uh, site that we had put up and other sites, um, it caused it to enter the search engines. And again, if you searched on Dow Chemical, you might stumble onto our site instead of the real one, which is what happened um, to a poor um, research assistant at the BBC one day in 2004, about a week before the 20th anniversary of the catastrophe. So this was a time when there was a lot of focus on the company, on Dow, a lot of angry uh, survivors and activists. And, and um, in the UK especially, with its huge Indian community, there was a lot of attention on this issue. Um, so the BBC was going to cover it extensively, and they reached out to Dow as part of their due diligence, except they stumbled onto us instead. And so one fine day, uh, I looked in the email, and there was this email from the BBC asking Dow for a comment and my first thought was, oh shit. And my second thought was, okay, we've got to answer and do something. And I wrote back and said, uh, we'd be thrilled to, to speak to you. And, and they were sh shocked because um, Dow usually just says nothing. You know, they'll, they'll refuse to say anything. They'll just provide a little blurb that says they don't have any responsibility for whatever reasons. Um, so it was very weird for the, to the BBC for, for the, um, Dow to respond with an enthusiastic yes. And then we spent the next seven days 
uh, frantically trying to figure out what to do, um, talking with our friends at Greenpeace, um, weighing different approaches, um, and you know there were a number of different things we could have done. We could have gone on. It was live television, live uh, world television before 350 million people, they told us. Um, so we could have done anything. And I'll just show you what we chose to do. This is from our second movie, The Yes Men Fix the World. Um, and I think it sort of explains itself, so I'll just show it. Let's see. Um, don't don't film too much when we get there. I think. And you're watching BBC World. Our main headlines: the world's worst industrial accident is being remembered in India today. It's 20 years since deadly gas leaked from the Union Carbide chemical plant in the city of Bhopal. At least 18. Thousand deaths are attributed to the leak, yes. and many local people say the contamination has never been properly cleared up. Yeah. Should I typically just look yeah. right into the camera? Okay. The factory still exists here, and that's been a real problem for the people living here locally. I mean, there's a site I've been to it, and it's full of toxic waste. People who are living in these houses, they've all got a story to tell One. about that day 20 years ago. Many of them lost members of their family, and they say that they're continuing to suffer because of the tragedy. And they're saying, somebody needs to answer for this. Legally, what they're saying is that they want to pursue the company to try and clean up the site, but whether the company will accept liability seems doubtful. Well, joining us live from Paris now is Jude Finisterra. He's a spokesman for Dow Chemicals, which took over Union Carbide. Uh, good morning to you. Um, a day of commemoration in Bhopal. Do you now accept uh, responsibility for what happened. Steve, yes. T today is a great day for all of us at Dow, and I think for millions of people around the world as well. It's 20 years since the disaster, and today I'm very, very happy to announce that for the first time, Dow is accepting full responsibility for the Bhopal catastrophe. We have a $12 billion plan to finally, at long last, fully compensate the victims, including the 120,000 who may need medical care for their entire lives, and to fully and swiftly remediate the Bhopal plant site. Now, when we acquired Union Carbide three years ago, we knew what we were getting, and it's worth $12 billion. $12 billion, we have resolved to liquidate Union Carbide this nightmare for the world and this headache for Dow, and use the $12 billion to adequately compensate the victims. Jude, that, that's good news that you have finally accepted responsibility. Uh, some people would say too late, it's three years, yes. almost four years on. When we acquired Union Carbide, we did settle their liabilities in the United States immediately. And we are now, three years later, prepared to do the same in India. We should have done it three years ago. We are doing it now. And I would also like to say that this is no small matter, Steve. This is the first time in history that a publicly owned company of anything near the size of Dow has um, performed an action which is significantly against its bottom line simply because it's the right thing to do. And our shareholders may take a bit of a hit, Steve, but I think that if they're anything like me, they will be ecstatic to be part of such a historic occasion of doing right by those that we've wronged. Just to uh, reiterate what Jude Finisterra, the spokesman for Dow Chemicals, has just said, he says Dow Chemicals now fully accept responsibility for the events in Bhopal. Great. That's it. Great. Now they wanted. Radio, I can tell you one thing. We're not going out of business. We will continue to make profit. We will simply make slightly less profit than normal. But we are doing the right thing. We're comparing here, though, the value of money to the value of human life. And there is no comparison. It's a, it's a good
do things with nouns. Don't want to speak. Exactly. I mean, how often does Dao get to, yeah. you know? <laughs> it wouldn't be, I wouldn't want to be a Dao spokesperson otherwise. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> um, and, you know, we left, and as we left, um, the studio, you know, after a few more oh my gods, uh, got back to my apartment and uh, the BBC called, rang, it was a landline, we still had those, and, and said that they were really confused because Union Carbide uh, had just called them and said there was no Jude Finisterra working at the company. And I tried to tell them that, you know, of course Union Carbide would say that they're, they've been dissolved and they don't really even exist. Um, what do they know about who's, who's at Dow? But uh, that didn't really go over. And a little while later, they announced um, that it was a big hoax. And, um, and that was that. Um, this also came out a bit later. Um, very, oh, it was actually the same day, December 3rd. Um, it turned out that when the world believed that Dow was doing the right thing um, in Bhopal, their stock lost about $2 billion in value. And, and then when it was announced that that was a hoax, it just came right back uh, immediately. And that became the centerpiece of this entire film. That little stock dip um, became the centerpiece. I mean, it was really only 4% of their stock value, so it wasn't as big as we made it seem. It's not as big as $2 billion sounds, but it was significant. and. And it was really a lesson on what happens if, on why it's a bad idea to let the market make any decisions whatsoever. Um, because if you do, they'll punish a company for doing the right thing and reward them for doing the wrong thing. So that became the central thing about why we need um, democracy and not corporate democracy. Um, there were a bunch of other things in that film that kind of like reinforced that and um, we made a big point about it. Um, oh yeah, so uh, the the BBC asked Dow to make a statement about the hoax and about their responsibility and you know or lack of, and Dow just turned around and issued the same little paragraph they always do, which is really boring. So we helped them a little bit and sent out a, a press release to our thousands of subscribers, um, probably including the BBC researcher. And <laughs> it was, uh, it said, it explained that it was a, a giant hoax and that the, the bad people who did it um, got everything wrong and we, Dow, just wanted to make sure the world understood all the things we will absolutely not do. Um, and this is one of the only pieces of fake news that I can say we've really put out because we never announced that this was not true, that this was not a real press release. And even like recently, people have said, oh my God, you got them to write this giant press release. And well, no, we didn't. But anyways, we don't, we usually reveal our hoaxes immediately if they're not revealed by the BBC, for example. Um, it was the first uh, Google search result for the day. And there were about 600 articles in the US press about it. And you know, from the number of hands earlier, uh, people hadn't, uh, many people then, as now, hadn't even heard of the Bhopal disaster, let alone uh, Dow's responsibility for it. And it was really important to connect Dow with the Bhopal disaster. So that is what it was about. And you know, in Britain, it kind of didn't make sense because everybody knew about it. But in the U.S., the U.S. is what it was really targeted as, where it was really targeted. And um, I'd have to say it succeeded at doing that. And now I know we're having a, a official Q&A session, but um, there are so many directions we could go from here. 
And so um, before assuming that you have certain questions, I'll just let you ask them. Um, if there's something you're more interested in about this, anything. Um, you mean to the to the climate? Just to there, I mean, anything specifically? You mentioned like, like fake news. Or there's just more and more misdirection in actual news versus what you guys are doing. Yeah. So I guess I'm just curious to hear you talk about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. The uh, the you know it it's not like we have to do anything differently because we're not. What we do, we don't consider unethical in any way. Um, you know, we reveal it right away, um, generally, except for that press release. Um, and that makes it really distinct from the kind of fake news that goes out and is intended to influence politics through its lies. Um, so we don't actually have to change anything in, in what we do, but we do have to respond to that reality that people um, are concerned about fake news and might mistake what we do for fake news. So we recently put out a fake Washington Post, uh, distributed uh, thousands of um, copies in DC, and it got a lot of press, um, successful in like highlighting how we can get rid of Trump, um, at least one theory of it, um, sparking large protests, and there was a guide to protest in it. Um, but one of the articles we included in it was about, um, was this, how um, you know this fictional Washington Post had come out a few months before um, predicting what actually happened. So this, this fake newspaper was set six months in the future or so, and so this was like pretending to be, you know, a, a weird meta article talking about basically why we had done it with this coding of humor. So yeah, we had to write this pay this article, and we wouldn't have if not for that anticipating that accusation. But other than that, we haven't really changed our approach. Yep. How do you guys avoid um, being sued? I mean, you live in such a litigious culture, and these are giant multinational corporations. Yeah. How have we avoided being sued? Um, we haven't. We've been sued once. Um, and for anybody who saw the Yes Men Are Revolting, how many people saw that? Okay, yeah, so I won't show that clip, but there's, you can see it um, probably online somewhere if you have BitTorrent. Um, the US Chamber of Commerce sued us after we um, gave a press conference on their behalf. The US Chamber of Commerce is actually the world's largest lobbying organization, and their clients are all large corporations. So they lobby against things like climate change legislation and workers' rights and so on. Um, and we spoke on their behalf and announced that they were, um, rather than opposing um, climate change measures, they were calling for stronger ones that would actually work because you know, global destruction is really bad for business, that sort of thing. So um, it was a, quite a, an emotional moment and they got wind of it as it was happening. The real Chamber of Commerce got wind of the press conference. And their head of PR, who I don't know where he learned about PR, but he stormed into the, the room with all these television cameras there, ours. Um, they weren't television cameras, they were cameras, which then became, uh, you know, the footage became very widely seen on, on television because he created such a scene. And it was funny to see the real and the fake um, Chamber of Commerce reps going at each other. Um, really fun bit of television. I think you'll agree <laughs> if you saw it. Um, but the, the Chamber of Commerce also was really pissed after that especially, and they actually sued us. And that also was a strange decision because um, they weren't probably going to win. And I'm not sure what they thought they were going to get out of it, but they didn't make much of a calculation in doing that apparently. Um, they just didn't seem to care. They were just, somebody there was pissed and they just sued us, which made, you know, it didn't make 
good sense, but it didn't make terrible sense either. Because their clients, again, are big corporations, and big corporations don't care if they sue the yes men. But if they were a big corporation themselves trying to sell something to the public, they would make a different judgment. Because the risks of bad publicity are, are pretty high when you go out and sue media activists. Um, as not just us, but many media activists have proven. Um, if you want to see a, a movie about that, it's called McLeibel, uh, the McLeibel case, where some activists just dragged McDonald's through the mud for 10 years because McDonald's was trying to sue them. So I think since then, uh, corporations have just not really gone after activists. It's you know the court of public opinion, which is not a court, but uh, it's like they'll, they'll get a lot of blowback if they do that. I think it's that kind of calculation. We do get a lot of threats, um, and they have to threaten us if we violate their trademark, for example, like with the Washington Post using their logo, they have to threaten us. They have to say, if you don't take down every copy of this and go and retrieve all the ones that you distributed, we will sue you, or we reserve the right to sue you. They have to do that in order to maintain their trademark, but they don't mean it. Um, so we just laugh and, you know, maybe respond with a joke or whatever. We do ask our lawyers. We have volunteer lawyers uh, from the Electronic Frontier Foundation who do help us respond in a jokey way. But, yeah. Any other questions? Oh. Wait, it hasn't been on the screen? That's... Just mirror the uh, mirror the displays. Do it. As I said, it's been a while since I've given a presentation. I've forgotten how these things work. Um, system preferences. Um, any other questions while well, I'm trying to figure this out? Wait, hold on. Uh, oh, it's done. I don't know why it was. Did you guys not see that while I was talking? I don't know. OK. Well, this is the fake Washington Post. And that's the article uh, about the fake Washington Post. Great question. So some of the funding comes from making the film. Um, you know, we, we raise budgets to, to make it um, and pay editors and pay a director and so on. Um, but each of the actions tends to be paid for by an NGO. So we went to Uganda. I think it was ActionAid who brought us to Uganda to give workshops with the activists there around climate change. and. Uh, exactly how that happened, but the, the young woman who's a politician now, who was in the um, Copenhagen climate talks, 
who posed as um, a representative of Uganda, uh, we had met her in Copenhagen, and then we wanted to follow up with her in Uganda and have her show us uh, you know, what she was concerned about. And so we arranged with ActionAid to give a conference there, and that's how we ended up going. So we just had to hire a um, camera person to come along, and that wasn't a huge um, expense. Um, and it tends to be like that. Like we partner, I guess you could just call it partnering with these organizations. That was me. <laughs> oh, I think I exaggerated my getting fired. Um, you're talking about the Yes Men Are Revolting, our latest film, which has this sorrowful personal story that um, kind of went overboard. But uh, in it, I, I talk about getting fired a lot. And in, in fact, I, I didn't really get fired. I got. I had one, I, I mean, I've gotten fired a lot from corporate jobs, um, but not, not from academic jobs. I had one job at Parsons for five years. Um, that was the duration of the contract, and then I went to NYU for four years, so I guess you could call, I think I dramatized the Parsons uh, ending of the, you know, getting to the end of the five-year contract as getting fired for the sake of the film. So I guess that's also fake news. Uh, <laughs> but inconsequential. Um, it's a movie, you know, people don't expect everything to be true. Um, but, that, and that answers how I was making a living, I think, like teaching for nine years. And the last three years I haven't been, um, I've just been working on this, move, this new movie and various projects. Um, but I will have to go back to teaching one of these days. And I love it, so. Um, maybe I'll show a couple of clips of um, one of the uh, projects that I did while I was teaching at NYU. Um, there it is. All right, hold on. So, since we're on the subject of teaching, uh, this is a, we did a lot of projects. Always when I give a talk, I try to communicate that um, there's nothing all that special about the kind of work that we do. Um, it's not rocket science. It's just a matter of looking at the situation, figuring out how to intervene, and how to make a bit of a splash around an issue and then doing it and putting the pieces together. Um, and we always get something wrong and uh, go into endless detail about the various things that we've gotten wrong, but it works anyways. And this is an example of a project that we did um, with students at NYU. When I was there, uh, I ran a kind of workshop for, for activists and students called uh, the Yes Lab. And um, the idea was, you know, a, an organization or a, a group of concerned people would come forward um, and want to do a brainstorm around a particular issue. And this, uh, and at a certain point, um, a woman who represented an organization uh, opposed to a policy called stop and frisk, um, we had a, a a brainstorm with her, a workshop with her, to figure out what kind of thing we could do around that. Stop and frisk, does this, everybody know what that is, was? Really? It's amazing. Um, it, at the time, uh, just, well, the video explains what it is too, but um, this policy was being opposed by a whole lot of people um, in New York, and it was getting a lot of attention um, but these activists wanted to try doing a prank around it. And we had this brainstorm, and somebody, and you know, various ideas were thrown out, uh, were proposed. And 
one of the ideas that was proposed um, made everybody kind of cringe and laugh at the same time. And so we kind of sensed that that was a good idea. Um, but the person who had brought the uh, whole brainstorm together was just appalled and immediately said, oh no, there's no way we can do that. That's just going to piss everybody off. And so I just said, well, you know, go and talk to your people. Go and talk to your organization and see what they think. And they loved it, so we did it. And this, this is the result. Seemed like a joke from the start. If you are stopped and frisked three times by the NYPD, you get a free Happy Meal. Well, it was a fake, but the ad and the website, where it came from, spread quickly online and had some believing it was true. Eyewitness News reporter Kristen Thorne shows us what happened and who was behind it. That's why we're excited to introduce our new Three Strikes You're In initiative. While the NYPD can't stop using stop and frisk, McDonald's can help police reward law-abiding citizens. McDonald's and the NYPD teaming up to get guns and drugs off the streets seems strange. Well, it should. It's part of a spoof website called threestrikesyourein.org. Every time you are stopped, frisked, and released, simply fill out your name, ethnicity, date and time of stop, and the officer's badge number. After three stops, you're in. Bring your completed voucher to your nearest McDonald's and exchange it for a free Happy Meal. People talk about broken window policing, but we'd like them to think about issues like what happens in a young person's mind when they know that when they leave the house, they're targeted. Jerry Goralnik and Ziva Durant created the site. They're with a local activist group called People Enraged by Racial Policing. The NYPD stops and frisks some 600,000 people every year. Critics say it encourages racial profiling. The department says it's a vital way to reduce violent crime. We wanted to make the connection between race and, and bias-based um, policing. What's disturbing is their satire could actually be taken as real. Goralnik and Durant put it to the test, sending one of their own into a local McDonald's with one of the fake vouchers. The manager looks at the voucher, ponders it for a second, and then puts in the order. We reached out to the NYPD about all this, but they didn't get back to us. A spokeswoman for McDonald's says she's glad we realize this entire thing is just made up. As for the site, Three Strikes You're In, it was taken down within hours of being posted because of a copyright infringement. In Sunnyside, Queens, Kristen Thorne, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Um, so I love showing that because it kind of exemplifies how this can work at best. Um, you know, a lot went wrong. Like she mentions, the site was taken down due to a uh, copyright infringement, which it was, because we had hosted it with the wrong company that we knew we shouldn't, um, but we did. And, uh, but that wasn't a problem, as it turned out, because she got to, you know, have this little bit of controversy at the end, like copyright infringement, and um, it's what the news needs. Uh, but this, that piece, I think, we couldn't have really put together a better piece ourselves, but um, you know we provided all the the elements, the video, the the visual, the story. She actually suggested that we come up with the uh, that that people go into the McDonald's and try to use the uh, the the vouchers. So this was a real collaboration with the media, which all of these things are. Um, that was just much more explicit than usual. Um, a lot of uh, Companies, of course, do produce these sorts of videos, um, completely ready-made. I think something like 30% of the local news that you see is actually produced by corporations and sent to the news station. Um, so, you know, talk about fake news. That's, and that's been going on for decades. Uh, it's a multi-billion dollar industry.
Yeah. See, that, that's a great question, and that's what that movie is supposed to be about. <laughs> um, it ended up not being as clear a movie as I would have liked, but um, the answer is like social movements. So we did, um, in that movie, we did a bunch of actions, and then eventually Occupy Wall Street breaks out, and that's, you know, there's a little moment where we say, this is awesome, look, now we're excited again. But that's really the truth, is that, um, you know, we got our start inspired by a social movement, the anti-globalization movement and the giant Battle of Seattle, you know, these protesters headed to shut down the WTO, and we kind of got inspired by that to do our first action. Um, and it's been consistently that. Um, when we were filming that, that movie at Occupy Wall Street, um, a lot of activists would come up to us while we were together filming and say, um, yeah, I, I saw your movie in 2004 or 2009, one of them, and that's when I first started thinking about activism or whatever, they'd seen it as a teenager. And, you know, it, would ha it happened a few times, not all the time, but it happened a few times. And, that's sort of the, the, you know, that's where a lot of the motivation to keep doing this comes. It's just having this faith that it does make a difference, even though it's not visible. Like, you know, Dow didn't, didn't actually do anything in response to our action. Um, there, you can't really point to a concrete result to any of the actions that we've done, but, um, a lot of the movements that we've been a part of have succeeded. And, you know, it may be through uh, people just, um, I mean, generally there's already a movement and we just kind of like add a little drop to it. Um, that's the idea. Um, and I think that, you know, that's why we get inspired by certain movements, because they're winning, <laughs> they're exciting and you can feel it. Like the stop and frisk movement, for example, in New York um, had a lot of momentum behind it. That's why there was somebody who was excited to do this, and that's why uh, we were excited to do it. And not long, you know, maybe, I don't know, was it six months later, uh, there was the mayoral election in New York, and one of the candidates, de Blasio, who had run on a platform of ending stop and frisk, won um, the mayorship. Um, because there was so much enthusiasm and he promptly did end that policy in New York. So, you know, these movements generally win. Um, individual actions never actually do. They never cause, uh, whether it's a protest or a, a, a sit-down, um, you know, a, a sit-in or, or one of these actions, they never actually change anything by themselves. It's always as part of a much bigger thing. And so that's kind of what keeps us inspired, partly getting feedback from people that it made a difference to them, and partly just knowing that, you know, eventually things change, and it's due to a lot of people struggling in their own ways. Um, Well, a lot of rehearsal, like that, the Dow um, thing on the BBC there, you know, I must have gone over the answers a hundred times before that, just reading them and reading them. You see, on the way, on the street, I'm like rehearsing with with Mike, with, um, uh, you know, trying to get it right, and you see when I actually say it on TV, it's not the same thing. Um, that's, so part of it's that, part of it's just knowing what I want to talk about, and using the standard PR technique of bridging, where no matter what the question is, you go to one of your answers. So I had maybe six answers, and that's it. And to my shock, I got through all of them, and that's un kind of unusual. Like I had six things I was going to talk about, and he asked, it was much longer interview than, than what's in the movie, of course, 
Um, yeah, when I look at the paper and go, ah, it's like, gosh, I'm glad he didn't ask any other questions because I don't have any more answers. Um, so that's the technique. And, and the, the thing is, PR reps are not super great actors. They look nervous. They, you know, they try to think of what they're going to say. It's all off the cuff. So if you're a little bit incompetent at it, it's totally normal. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know how I would have exactly screwed up, except maybe not having any idea what I was about to talk about. Um, but as far as you know, acting, I just looked like a human being trying to remember what he wanted to say, which is what I was. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it, I mean, part of it is about, I think, like, you know, how easy it is to suspend disbelief without even, like, you know, going to all these conferences and um, you see these people just lap up whatever it is we're talking about. And so part of it is about, yeah, it's just people will believe anything. And isn't that a little scary when you can say these horrible things in these conferences and they'll just lap it up? Um, I haven't shown any of those clips, but um, maybe I could show one, just so we've done that, and then maybe we segue. Okay, so I'll show one of the other kind of clips, um, the other kind of uh, actions that we do. Um, movies, super professional here, right? Uh, So, how long is this? Ooh, it's five minutes. That's a little long. Um, maybe I'll, yeah? Okay, five minutes. Um, this is a piece from our second movie that, how many people have seen The Yes Men Fix the World? Oh, good, four. So you'll have to watch this again. Um, <laughs> this is, you know, one of those examples of like people in a conference setting just lapping it up. You'll see that um, there's a kind of confrontation in the conference. I'll just give you away, I'll, I'll give away the secret, uh, which you won't see in the film, of how that happened. Somebody at one of the tables uh, in, the, in the little conference recognized us from uh, our previous movie, our 2003 movie, and texted the conference organizers. And then immediately, uh, as soon as she had texted him, she was like, oh, did I do? I want to see how this plays out. Um, which she did get to see because it took him forever to actually intervene. Um, and we knew that because we had activists stationed at each table. Um, but yeah, basically, you, well, I think it might address what you uh, mentioned, what you talked about. And I'll just show this um, as an example of the other kind of thing that we're actually more famous for than the BBC type thing. So it started out, we made one Reggie, and then we cast a bunch of Reggies in, in wax. That's human hair right there. This is a lot of experimenting to figure out how to make a candle smell like human flesh. Ow! I lost a Reggie. Quick! Ow! We wanted to make sure that the oilmen knew what the candles they'd be holding were made of. So we'd show them a tribute video to Reggie Watts, a terminally ill Exxon janitor who had volunteered to be turned into fuel. I think I'd like to be a, I think I'd like to be a, a, a candle. 
I think a candle would be fun because you can, there's just so many uses for a candle. There are six billion people on this earth today. We're probably using the energies, maybe, of a billion of those at best. They had me uh, test a Hellfire missile once. That was pretty cool. We simply haven't found the miracle fuel yet to replace petroleum, but we'll eventually get there if government gets out of the way. We had his miracle fuel, and our grandfathers were turning over in their mass graves. CTV News with Barb Higgins and Daryl Chance. Good evening. A bizarre situation today at the Go Expo Energy Conference at Stampede Park. Organizers and hundreds of Alberta oil and gas executives got duped. They've been promised a major announcement from a major player in the energy industry. Attendees paid 50 bucks a head to hear this speech from the National Petroleum Council, a group that advises the White House on oil and gas matters. Welcome to Go Expo's keynote luncheon. Please welcome SK Wolf. First, I need to say how wonderful it is to see on all the faces here today the childlike exuberance of a great industry in full flower. And why not? Without oil, at least four billion people would starve, and starving would become the new black. But I'm not here today to pat us all on the back. I'm here to speak of Plan Bs. As Andy began outlining Exxon's tough solution to climate change, 10 volunteers passed out 300 human flesh candles. This vigil would be like no other. Who first had the idea to use the oil of a recently living animal to light his or her house? Even today, Shetland Islanders cut the heads off their puffins and put wicks in the stumps to make candles. We at Exxon <laughs> firmly believe that a free market will, if left to its own devices, always find solutions to the dilemmas that humanity faces. We're calling our new technology Vivolium. As Andy began to describe Exxon's new biofuel, the candles were lit. A strange odor rose into the air. What you see here is an artist's rendition of an advanced large-scale plant. The Vivolium feedstock is renewable and unprecious and responds to the need of a shrinking market with greater supply. The dance of capital appears in full flower. <laughs> Finally, it was time to introduce Reggie Watts, the dying Exxon janitor who had volunteered to be turned into fuel. And now we begin the tribute video to Reggie Watts. Worked in maintenance for a while. Moved up to uh, maintenance too. Started doing cleanup, toxic spill cleanup. After uh, I heard from the doctor that I was gonna die, I felt like I had something to live for. Could this this is I think I'd like to be a, a, a candle. There's just so many uses for a candle. I mean, you know, like just you know, romantic. Like that'd be nice to know. I was a candle on a table. You know, when people uh, when they first met each other on a date. <laughs> I think that that would be great. I'd love that. I mean, that'd be a good. Idea. This is a funerary observance. I mean, this guy died. Switch this off before this I man die. It's people. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> I'm very sorry, but we've been uh, cut off. Apparently, we're not allowed to have a funerary observance for a man who's died to make a product possible. And I'm, I'm being, uh, you, why, you, are you allowed to do that to me? Bridging wants to get the next on mobile employee, and these are actually 30 or 40 percent from his, his actual. 80%, I'm the sorry. The remaining 20 is for what? The remaining 20 is just, you know, bind binders, bonders, uh, to keep it together. We have to think it's in it's such it's a case. What are your credentials with ExxonMobil? So, what is it? Sorry? That, what part of his body is it? Please, please, please. <laughs>
Thank you. Hey. Shut it down. Shut it down. Now. If you can um, stick around for a little bit, we have a few questions um, from uh, our small panel with Furman, Jing Yi, and Cassie. Um, so I, um, I asked you a racial question earlier. Um, <laughs> we are continuing with the theme. Um, so I um, thank you for showing us your trailer for um, the Yes Men Build a Wall. Um, I think that topic is um, politically or um, inherently racial, and I was wondering if you were um, planning on continuing with that work, or um, specifically racial activism. Yeah, I mean, we have an outline for the movie, and we kind of know what, you know, roughly what we're going to do. But exactly how we treat it is, you know, we're not yet at that level of detail. But yeah, I mean, it is obviously racial, wherever walls are being built, you know, whether it's in Europe, a lot of them, uh, Israel, um, or in the US, it's like, you know, so I think it's inevitable, yeah. Yeah, I guess I was um, like curious if you had any interest in working with um, uh, like Black Lives Matter or something similar. Yeah, um, we had a little, uh, brainstorm going with Black Lives Matter at one point that didn't, um, I forget why, but you know, I mean, a lot of things don't work out or don't happen. Um, but yeah, of course. Uh, we recently worked with Four Freedoms. Um, they helped us a bit with the newspaper. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, it's like, Racial issues, economic issues, um, political issues, it's all so intertwined, you know, especially in a country that's founded on the things that our country is founded on, um, you know, which is super intricately tied up with capitalism and the expansion of, you know, the, I mean, the conquest of the new world was only possible once the idea of venture capital existed and, you know, the country wouldn't be what it is if you know, we hadn't sent ships over to Africa. <laughs> it, so it's like inherently, yeah, if you're talking about anything, it's like it's right there. Uh, not saying anything you don't know. <laughs> sure. Question is, uh, what's your main focus within the uh, activism and uh, what, how it changed past, uh, during the past like 20 or more than 20 years? Mm -hmm. And what's your like uh, hope to accomplish? Yeah, great. Um, it's kind of been consistent. We, when we started uh, working on a project, the project that Patrick mentioned, uh, RT Mark, long story, but it, it was inspired uh, both by happenstance, just stumbled into doing this weird thing, and the issue that really struck us that we could uh, address was corporate personhood at the time. The rights that corporations have arrogated under the US Constitution to be, you know, be able to sue as if they were people. Um, and we really focused on that, and then there was the anti-globalization movement, same issue, but of course expanded to global capital and its rights, uh, how the rights of global capital would preempt the rights of, of nations to determine you know, what, sh what should be within our borders. Um, 
then with the second film, and that was the first film. The second film, we talked about climate change and you know corporations having this, uh, the market being trusted to the point where we would end up, um, if we leave the market, the ability to, to make decisions, if we give it the ability to make political decisions, we're gonna end up destroying the entire world. So that was sort of what that was about. And the third movie was sort of about uh, social movements and how you could really change that. Um, so it's it's all within the same sphere, you know. It's all within. It's all talking about corporate power and you know trusting the market and an alternative to that. And this fourth film seems like it's different. We're talking about walls and and all that, but actually, it's a very similar issue. It's just you know, the way things have evolved now. I mean, we have this crazy right-wing shit going on because, I mean, I think it's in large part because the Democrats didn't ever offer any alternative vision to neoliberalism. You know, there was just this, they embraced it with a slightly different flavor from the way the Republicans embraced it, but both parties were just embracing this, this totally uh, messed up system that has left tons and tons of people in the dust. Um, and there was nothing being offered uh, from the left. Um, I mean, except there was. There was, you know, Occupy Wall Street sprang up and that fueled uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign. So there were these populist left measures being offered, um, but they weren't accepted by the Democrats. And on the other side, somehow they were. The, the far right populist measures were succeeded. So we ended up with this. So it's sort of about the same thing. Um, that'll be a message in the film. It'll, it'll sort of have as, as it, one of its main message, it'll be like uh, to the left, like it's time to, to wake up and actually do something and you know embrace populism from our side. Um, and yeah, and that's sort of the same issue. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question is, because when I was uh, watching the, the Yes Man is Revolting, uh, when you guys go into Uganda and to solve the climate change problem, there's another problem that pops. Yeah, you mentioned that it's about the uh, uh, death penalty for a homosexual in Uganda. Yeah. You said you're going to do something <laughs> about it. So, what you did? Well, what we tried to do, um, yeah, so we. Once we had decided to go to Uganda, it like st after we'd made the decision, it struck me that it was really stupid. Like I'm, I did not want to go there, and I did not want to include Uganda in the film unless we talked about that because it's so egregious. Um, and you know, of course, the scene is in the film, so it made it known. But who cares? Certainly, Uganda doesn't. So what I tried to do afterwards was pressure. Uh, the NGO, the climate change concerned ecological NGO that had brought us and that we had done a workshop with to uh, take a, a stand against the government's position on, on homosexuality. Um, it didn't work, <laughs> but I tried to do that. Um, and, you know, they had their own reasons for that. Um, they do a lot of good work, and I guess they judged that would be too politically risky. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, you know, as I said, actions fail. <laughs> Movements succeed and there wasn't really a movement involved. Um, so I guess, so going off of that, um, what would you say is your most successful work or um, your favorite? That's a great or both. Question. Yeah. I mean, I really love looking at um, you know, really weird, funny actions that we do that are part of a bigger movement that, that succeeds. Um, one of the funnest examples of that, uh, and, and this one actually may have had some sort of effect. Uh, we, and I haven't told this story for a while, so I'm going to have to, um, yeah, we, we were working with Rainforest Action Network um, trying to figure out what to do uh, around Chevron's... Uh, Chevron is responsible for 
the largest oil spill in all of history. And it was a, an oil spill that went on for decades in Ecuador. They basically, their network of pipes, uh, uh, substandard pipes leaked and spilled so much oil all over Ecuador that, um, you know, it's a giant toxic mess and uh, responsible for enormous amount of death. And Ecuador sued Chevron for a lot of money. I can't remember the exact amount, but billions of dollars. And that case was moving through the courts and... Um, Rainforest Action Network was involved in the lawsuit and wanted to see if we could do some kind of yes men thing with them um, around that. So we had a whole action planned and then suddenly we found out um, that actually Chevron was about to launch a whole new ad campaign. They were about to rebrand themselves completely and we knew what it would look like um, because there was an activist within um, the Rainforest Action Network, network, uh, who had been hired by Chevron, he was a street artist, and he had been hired by Chevron to put up some street art on behalf of Chevron. And he had said, oh yeah, sure. And he took the art and he leaked it to Rainforest Action Network who contacted us. And so we knew exactly what the, Rain the Chevron campaign was gonna look like. And so of course, no brainer, we produced it for them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with slightly different messages, like, you know, uh, theirs was, they had all these um, posters that looked like street art that were like, the message was, well, I won't even bother to say what, because it was profoundly stupid, but we put up messages that looked exactly the same uh, with the Chevron logo, the same exact look to the posters that said, you know, um, that made reference to the Ecuadorian situation and the lawsuit and, you know, all that which they definitely didn't want to talk about. Um, and we made a website, and we managed to launch our entire campaign like four hours before they did. And they knew we were launching it, and we could see that because they were visiting our site. We got little, um, little you know, IP evidence, and we were watching their site <laughs> as it was like piecing itself together. And then we launched ours um, and sent out a press release announcing that you know we, Chevron, were uh, putting out this, this ad campaign which was truly revolutionary and we were very proud of it. And like Fast Company and a few other company, uh, a few other uh, publications fell for it and wrote like, Fast Company actually wrote a really critical article and said like, yeah, Chevron's paying lip service to this now. Um, <laughs> Um, and then, you know, realized the, the mistake. And it, it got a huge amount of press and kind of fucked up their, their ad campaign forever because on the back of this, we launched a crowdsourcing kind of like competition for whoever could make the best ad for Chevron. Um, and people just did. They just sent in ad after ad after ad, um, you know, with the exact same look. We provide the the... Photoshop files, and the internet was soon flooded uh, by these ads. So if you search on Chevron, what was it? I can't even remember their slogan. Uh, Chevron, whatever it is. If you search on, eh, I guess I have to do it. Let's see. For, for years, and I'm not sure it's true. So this is their, oh yeah, uh, this is real. Um, and they were kind of adopting a sort of, you know, angry towards oil company, towards oil company's persona. This was right after the, uh, the spill, the Deepwater Horizon spill. So, um, you know, they were trying to co-op that. Th these were theirs. Uh, this was ours, or not ours, but one of the, you know, many, many people who submitted ads. This was theirs. Um, <laughs> this was ours. This, you know, uh, this. This was one of our original ones. Um, oil companies should clean up their messes. Um, then, you know, these were crowdsourced. Um, this was theirs. 
This was somebody's. This was somebody's. This is theirs. <laughs> this is somebody's. So, you know, obviously their campaign didn't quite work out the way they had hoped. So that's, I think, my favorite, because you can point to this concrete, stupid result. Not that, um, I mean, the lawsuit, by the way, won. They won the lawsuit, not because of this, or, but, you know, public opinion had something to do with that. And, of course, it's going to take decades for Chevron to actually pay up the billions that they owe, and they'll find some way not to do it. But, you know, small steps, I guess. I want to ask you a, a general question. Um, I'm not a film person at all. I'm not even an artist. I teach philosophy here. So uh, I've, I've been often impressed by your movies for the use of humor. And I was listening to you right now, and I was thinking, isn't it you know, kind of um, a little sad, I guess, that the Occupy movement has a lower profile than you know, the Tea Party has kind of been vindicated. And I'm wondering about the nature of a protest. and. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link the two together in this way. I'm, I've always been impressed by your use of humor, and I want, I want to know why. And then I want to ask you this second question. Why is political satire, why is it just about always left wing? I can't think of any right wing yes men. Can you? Well, I can think of right wing uh, uh, infiltrators, pretenders, fake. Like O'Keefe, right? Yeah, that's who I'm thinking of. But he doesn't try to be funny, does he? No. Why? Uh, no, no, definitely not. It's not funny. The whole right wing <laughs> thing is like, uh, <laughs> it isn't. I mean, I think he did one of his actions in Baltimore. Uh, could Am I right? Oh, Acorn. Acorn. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's not funny to um, mess with the truth in that way and put out fake statements. So, that, yeah, it's not funny at all. And Right-wingery isn't funny because it's privileging the wealthy, and yeah. it's saying, like, the wealthy deserve to be wealthy, and um, poor people deserve to be poor, and there's nothing funny about that. And humor at the expense of the powerless just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. There's nothing funny about it. Yeah. Funny at the expense of the powerful is inherently funny. Like, you can make a very primitive joke, and it's funny if you're attacking somebody very powerful. So I think, yeah, it just lends itself to funny. Well, I was a little sad when I heard you say in the trailer for your upcoming movie that I think you guys said it's not funny anymore. Oh, yeah. And I really hope that that doesn't mean you'll not use humor. But how do you find that humor is, yeah, how do you find humor is useful, though? Um, well, it's funny. So it makes you laugh. And it's nice to laugh. <laughs> Oppressed people. About stuff that we should be angry about. Yeah. No, we have to be angry about it, but we have to survive it. Um, oppressed people have the best jokes. You know, anybody mm. who's undergone any oppression has the best jokes. It's a survival mechanism. Right. Like, you know, I this upcoming movie, I'm really happy because it has a bunch of jokes about the Holocaust in it, um, as, you know, this one did. <laughs> and I love laughing about the Holocaust, even though it's not funny at all. Um, and I... You know, I feel like I have a right to because my grandfather died at Auschwitz. And, but, you know, it just comes. It's just like you have to laugh about that stuff. And you have to, it's a way of surviving it, of keeping it in the mind without it destroying you. You know, you, you, you laugh at a joke. It's, it's a very similar response to crying uh, physiologically, but it's totally survivable. Yeah. <laughs> you can do it. And, and it, so that's, that's one reason laughing, I think, is really important. It's just basic survival. The other thing is, um, as a technique for getting attention for things, it's just much easier for the media to cover something if there's humor attached, like the uh, stop and frisk thing. Right. They were covering stop and frisk. It was getting plenty of attention through protests. But this particular thing, you know, we, we got a certain amount of attention for it because we used this stupid joke mm -hmm. that, that worked out. <laughs> um, it's... Yeah, it's, it just works that way. Does that piss off the companies more? Hopefully. Of course, we never know because, you know, we don't have a lot of spies within the companies. And they don't give us any signs on the outside except these threatening emails, which uh, we take with a grain of salt. And they don't really mean anything about what people are actually thinking within the you companies. You don't frame them. 
You don't print them out and frame them? We say we do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be work. Um, <laughs> but we often say we frame those, those threats. Yeah, no, humor is super valuable. And I don't think it takes away from energy, angry energy. I think it can actually increase it. Um, and it can be potent in itself. Like, there were so many Brezhnev jokes in the ex-Soviet Union that, you know, that's one of the ways that mockery spread. And, you know, awareness of how absurd the whole thing was spread through jokes. And they still brought it down somehow. So, yeah, humor is just a tool. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's a monument to whiteness, absolutely. That's, that's what you said, right? A sculpture yeah. to whiteness. It's absolutely true. And we, there's a line or two in the, or a short line in the trailer that, to, that, to that effect, but that's going to be an important thing. We were thinking of visiting the Great Wall of China because it turns out that was sort of a monument to, mainstream, to the Chinese power um, privileged class then. Um, it never actually kept out the invaders. It never even began to. You couldn't possibly defend a border that large, and they could just climb over it, or there were parts where it was, didn't exist. It was like a piecework wall, and it was actually the, the emperor, I can't remember his name offhand, who is most well known for finishing it, for finishing it to the degree that it was ever finished. It was clearly a vanity project that was about you know, putting forward his, it was about image. It was about communicating, this is an empire, I run it, you owe me fealty, and, you know, creating the idea of a nation, um, which is exactly what this wall is about. It's like, here, I'm gonna put this wall here and we're all gonna be. This, this movie came out of a project um, that we did in Mexico with um, a bunch of Mexican and Central American activists uh, a few years ago uh, called Somos el Muro that was aimed at, Mexican, at the Mexican public who were um, uh, acting in, in racist, way, racist, xenophobic ways towards Central Americans going through Mexico. Uh, towards the U.S. and there's a lot of that, a lot of racism within Mexico aimed at, at these people who are the main migrants and, and so we made this video all together in Spanish, which was a challenge um, for me, but uh, in which these people, uh, pretending to be a far-right Mexican organization called Somos el Muro, which um, said, yeah, Trump, you, you you say uh, Mexico's not gonna pay for your wall, um, or Mexico's gonna pay for your wall, well, I don't wanna pay for the wall, and I don't have to because I am the wall. I will be your wall, Mr. Trump, by, and then we list the various things that, you know, we Mexicans will do to keep these migrants out, report them to the police, all these things that are real. And so it was attempting to play this game and, and be this right-wing, Mexican organization to shame Mexicans for racism. It didn't work at all. Um, 
this is just a side note, it didn't work at all. We tried really hard to get it out there and tweeted at all the right-wing groups we could find. Um, it just didn't take until six months later, it just mysteriously took off and got two million views within a very short time in Honduras, <laughs> which was not the target. <laughs> these structures that exist to, to exemplify the poverty. Um, in some ways, you know, it's funny by you sort of doubling that and copying that with that project, it's something you're already, you're also doing in all of the online topics, the web space, mm -hmm. right? So this kind of mimetic process of making a secondary layer ultimately to critique it, you know, or like a, a mirror in front of a wall just to double it or, so, you know, something yeah. that, um, so there's this idea of definitely, you know, pushing down Yeah, and highlighting, trying to highlight what these things are for. Um, yeah, whether it's a website or a, you know, a wall, like Will said. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And I think it's always really good for us, we don't just want people to like see the post, but to show that it's actually there, right? Like, I mean, it's, I know, I, you know, wait, this is new, so how many feature films? But I mean, it's also like getting started, right? Yeah. And kind of, you know, using a lot of the skills that I think tricks that we've found um, for doing things, the ones that we saw that we could think of when we made the page. There's probably a lot more, um, but a lot of it we just kind of rediscover every time we do it. Um, we still have to think it through, like how, how do you actually get into a conference? And yeah, you pretend to be two people um, and you have an argument over email. <laughs> you know, just social engineering tricks. Um,
and at the same, very same time, Occupy Wall Street was doing exactly the same thing. And then there, there was like a whole group that wanted to head the Tea Party Union and so on, and I guess must have found like uh, a ballot, you know, the system, the market system, and you know, it's a authoritarian thing in a different way, or tapped into it. Um, unfortunately, they didn't, that didn't happen. Um, Bernie Sanders.